been inspired by you all, and every topic we're going to take on comes because of your frustrations, your challenges, your questions. And I don't want to cheat any panel team. So each panel team will have 20 minutes. Now, it'll be when they start. So we're going to talk about why do all developers want to come here with the park? <laughs> that, that, that's the first one. Now we had some printed agendas. Well, Sandy and I were held hostage at the meeting before this one, so I have to read you what it's going to be. First one, why do developers want to bring more apartments and why are zoning laws so complicated anyway? Now everybody wishes they could talk about that, but who we have is a unique panel. So you're going to hear from Amy Connolly. She's going to tell you there is a housing shortage, whether you knew it or not, nationwide. You will hear from DJ Harrell, who is over development services, which means anytime anybody wants to build anything, they have to go to his office. Please welcome former Councilman Frank Marshall. Just walk in. And you will also hear from Raphael. Raphael McDonald and I have been hooked to the hip since David Koresh, who was spoke on KRLD, and then Fox 4. And speaking of Fox 4, I did not know if our moderator would make it, because our moderator is Dion Anglin of Fox 4, and if you're watching that trial, you know, Michelle, my high school buddy, you've never come here never defeat him. I'm so glad to see you. That's my high school best friend. Uh, who lives in Woodhaven, and we did invite people from Woodhaven, White Lake Hills, and whatever other area that we may inherit. And so once again, there will be no questions until the third panel ends, okay? So you might make notes of questions that you want to hear, okay? The other thing you should know right there, Bob, oh, yeah. you you Now what you need to know about Dion Anglin is she is a true journalist. And so when I covered murder trials, you never knew what the jury was going to do. And so I was waiting on pins and needles until I had her call last night that she would be here. So please welcome Dion Angler. Now the first voice you hear will be from the man who writes the checks for all city employees, that being my city manager, David Cook. Uh, it's great to see everybody. I love coming to this place. And um, as I was driving over here today, I wanted to tell you about the two previous times. One was when we talked about the budget. Were some of you here? I, all right, some people. And the other time was when we talked about the bond program back that was approved in May. So when we were here before the May bond referendum, I just wanted to take the time to thank you all the referendums were approved, and there's a number of projects for this side of Fort Worth and that bond program that your council member, Mayor Pro Tem, Gina Bivens, is working on. It includes the Stop 6 Hub. Does everybody know about that project? It includes the parks out here. I can't remember what else. I'll start losing track. But Ms. Bivens has been responsible for a lot of activity that's occurring in East Fort Worth. She is a great voice for the east side of Fort Worth. I could also tell you that she almost got me killed when I was with her in the early part of coming to Fort Worth. Have you heard that story? All right, so, so I was with uh, Miss Bivens and she was driving around East Fort Worth and she wanted to show me the different neighborhoods. Now she did not take me to the nice neighborhoods. Right, because she wanted me to see some of the challenged neighborhoods on the east side of the town. And so we drive up, I think it's stop six. And there could have been some drug activity occurring at this house. Now there was, there was a house that was partially boarded up. So it, it, it meant to me that nobody was supposed to be living there. But there were some people on the front porch of this boarded up house uh, having a conversation with each other that she thought she needed to break up. And, and I'm thinking, I'm going to die. 
I know I wasn't that scared, but she says, I think there's some something illegal going on here, and I'm going to go break it up. She jumps out of the car, and I'm sitting in the front seat thinking, does she think I'm getting out of this car? <clears throat> uh, it all turned out just fine. Uh, they saw wisdom in fleeing the area. <clears throat> Once Gina jumped out of the car, um, but that's the type of person that Miss Bivens is. She's very active in the community, very interested in making sure that the right things happen out here. Uh, and so I just want to thank you for coming out. We have a number of city staff here. We got half the police department. Thanks guys for coming. It's good to see everybody. And thanks for attending. Uh, but we're available for questions, and I think the questions are after the three panels, right? Did I get that right? And the last thing I'll, I'll say simply is this is the time of the year that I'll just ask that you think about others. You think about friends, you think about family, and I'm just going to ask you to take this time to enjoy this time of the year, be thankful for the things that we have, uh, keep track of, again, friends, family, and neighbors, and uh, God bless everybody. Have fun the rest of the day. Right. Who, got, who has this next? Now we're going to turn it over to our moderator, Dion Anglin. I just want to first start off by saying thank you um, for um, the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, Bivens, City Manager <laughs> Cook, um, and all of you. It's a delight for me to play a a small role in this and I am um, just uh, happy about it for two reasons and first that it gives me a different perspective uh, other than uh, a working journalist to uh, see this end of how the city and city government works along with the community rather than um, how I'm pretty used to encapsulating topics in a minute and 30 seconds to uh, fit it into a newscast. The second reason uh, I just want to say that I'm so delighted to be here is because Fort Worth is my home. I was born here. Uh, I grew up in Stop 6 and also <laughs> so, so just um, to be able to cover Tarrant County, Fort Worth, uh, the east side, it's it really is a privilege for me. So again, thank you. And that said, we're gonna just jump right in with our questions. And I believe our first question is going to be directed toward, we'd love to hear from you, DJ. Why are there so many applications coming to the east side for apartments? <laughs> well, I, I don't think the east side is, is singled out for development. Um, you know, there's so many applications all over the city. Um, east side, um, and I know you know because most of you guys live on the east side, it's a beautiful place to live, right? Um, you know, we're one of the fastest growing cities in the country, and this is one of the nicer areas in our city where there's mature trees, right? We're uh, surrounded by the cross timbers, uh, and there's also, you know, great access to roadway uh, major networks, right, to get to 820, to 30, to 20, right, to 183, and all these other uh, uh, major roadway networks that connect us to our, uh, our partners around the region. So those are, you know, some of the major reasons I would guess that a, a lot of developers are, you know, reaching out to, uh, to, to uh, continue to develop in this area. Uh, and... That said, it segues right into our next question, and this will be for Ms. Connolly. Why are there so many requests coming to the city for apartments, and how does that tie into the housing shortage? Sure. So uh, just to introduce myself really quick, I'm Amy Connolly. I'm an assistant director in the Neighborhood Services Department for Fort Worth. And, and my particular division in Neighborhood Services uh, works a lot with housing affordability. Uh, we work with a lot of developers to do projects through our um, Fort Worth Housing Finance Corporation. Um, so we work in that affordability housing finance realm, along with our city council partners um, and a lot of our development partners. Um, so uh, the reason why the east side is seeing a lot of new housing development is, uh, first of all, it's a great market to build in. Um, 
there's a lot of uh, need for housing on mm -hmm. the east side of Fort Worth. It's near uh, transit, it's near highways. Uh, it, if you're looking for a job in Fort Worth and you want to live um, somewhere in Fort Worth affordably, living on the east side is a really good place to live. So that's primarily market-wise why you're seeing it. Um, adding in the piece for housing shortage, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I think, as you know, um, Fort Worth is growing tremendously. And um, while we have a lot of land that we can annex and bring into the city, um, we still have issues of where are jobs located in the city and where is housing located. What you really want to see is that jobs and housing need to be located relatively close together so you can have less driving, so people can live in neighborhoods close to where they work and they have a higher quality of life. Um, in Fort Worth, we're projected to add something like 200,000 new residents over the next 10 years. Um, and that kind of, when you break that down year by year, that means that maybe something like 20,000 residents are coming to the city of Fort Worth every year. So we have to find housing or have to build Build housing for 20,000 new people of all income levels. Um, we don't just have people that um, are billionaires moving to Fort Worth. We have people that have regular jobs that maybe pay $20 an hour, and they need a place to live just as much as everybody else does. So we have to think about not just housing and where it's located, but we also have to think about the income of the folks moving to Fort Worth, the income of the folks that live in Fort Worth, and where they can afford housing. Some interesting things have been happening in, in Fort Worth over the last 20 years. What we've seen is that we've seen a very um, slow rise in household income, and this is across the United States. Household incomes are not rising very fast. So, um, you know, it may be that, um, you know, we're not getting big raises anymore in our jobs. We, we may, um, you know, the economy is growing, but our, but our incomes are not really growing with it. But the sales price of new homes in Fort Worth have skyrocketed. So what we have today is that today in Fort Worth, the median, meaning the very middle household income in Fort Worth is $67,000 a year. So think about that. The average, the very middle person in Fort Worth, that household, meaning the mother, father, kids, or everybody who's contributing is making $67,000 a year. The median sale price of a home in Fort Worth is $350,000. That's the middle sales price. There's half above and half below. So when you think about that, there's a mismatch there. A household that makes $67,000 a year cannot afford a $350,000 house. They won't get approved for that. And this is happening all over DFW. This is actually have help, uh, across urban Texas. You know, in all the major cities in Texas, you're seeing um, elevated house prices compared to household income. You're seeing a limited supply. And what's being built is largely not apartments. But I think DJ will say, while we're getting more apartments, we're actually probably building a lot more single family houses in Fort Worth. And our income growth are just not keeping up with the sales price of housing. Um, so there, therein lies, we're having a housing shortage. We're having a housing shortage, not in the top levels of Fort Worth. We're having a housing shortage with lower income levels. People below median income are having a very hard time affording and finding housing in Fort Worth. So the market knows that, and developers who build apartments know that people can usually afford an apartment when they can't afford a home, or maybe that's a first step that they take in their path to home ownership, and so that's why you're seeing a lot of apartments. There's just a market for it. People can't afford to get into a single family home. They need apartments to live because there's just so many people coming here. So I hope that kind of explains what's going on in the market without a bunch of charts. I have a hard time explaining it without you know the graphs that have all the symbols that go up and up, but that kind of explains what's going on in the market. Well, thank you, it does, it provides a, um uh, a better look at that, and we'll have a chance to maybe uh, give you some other questions to answer along those lines sure. in just in just a bit. But I'll move along so that we can hear from Mr. McDonald, Raphael. Um, I'd like for you to address um, what role does zoning play in this discussion, and feel free to introduce yourself fully. 
Well, as, as I said, I'm Raphael McDonnell. I'm proud to be a Councilwoman Mayor Pro Tem Bivens appointee to the Zoning Commission. I've been there, I think, uh, four years or so uh, now. Uh, before that, I was on uh, Historic and Cultural Landmarks, and then I was on Urban Design. I will also acknowledge my fellow Commissioner, Wanda Collin, who uh, represents uh, District uh, 8, who's uh, with us here as well. Uh, she is really the, the queen here of the East Side in terms of her knowledge. I lean on her institutional knowledge uh, quite a bit, particularly on these things. Um, when we get requests from builders, uh, when we get requests from people to make uh, zoning changes on their properties, you know, they first go to staff. And then after they go through staff, they go through, uh, um, you know, in some cases, they have the pre-development conference where Sandy is very involved with. And then eventually it comes to us. Uh, after city staff reviews it, they'll give us a determination what way we go, one way or another. We do pay attention to that. We don't always agree with what city staff says. We get a lot, and I, I, would, I would say particularly if it's a, really a hot button case, we get a lot of response from the public, and that weighs very heavily in our decisions. Um, you know, we hear from various uh, neighborhood associations. John T. White has been very vocal about when there have been um, developments in that particular area and concerns that they have. Uh, uh, they speak from one voice as well as the individual members of the HOA speaking. And we've seen this also happen in a number of other areas, in a number of other areas throughout the city. And that's very important. It's very hard for folks to sometimes be able to make a meeting on a Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the I don't want to call it a blessing of the pandemic, but certainly one of the pluses, I think, is the ability for people to join these meetings virtually. It is vitally important that we you know, hear from the public when it comes time to make these decisions. We don't make these decisions lightly. I spend my weekends reading through the correspondence. If you've sent something, whether it is here in District 5 or whether it's in District 7 or District 3 or District 6, I'm going to read it because I have to cast a vote, and I'm going to cast the most informed vote I possibly can make. And so that's very important that we do hear from the public when it comes to these particular issues because these decisions are not made in a vacuum. Uh, I remember a couple years ago we had a, a, a person from uh, that city to the west, where I, or city to the east, where I uh, have a full-time job um, that uh, basically said that they were going to do whatever they wanted and they really didn't care about you know, our input. And uh, uh, myself and another commissioner who's no longer on the, on the zoning commission uh, set him straight. And I don't hesitate to do that if, you know, we have someone, we had, so we had someone this week talking about a particular project and they didn't reach out to the neighborhood until the day before the meeting. And I said, you reached out yesterday? No, that's not acceptable. That is not acceptable. So we, you know, we take our roles very seriously. We listen to you and we act accordingly. Thank you so much, Raphael. Um, I know that um, just listening to each of them uh, respond to the, the different uh, questions, you all do have some questions. And if you saw Mayor Pro Tem Bivens whispering in my ear just a moment ago, she's had a change of heart. And we are gonna take um, a few questions if there are any with regard to uh, the housing shortage, the influx of apartments, uh, seeking to locate here. So if you have a question, Now's the time. Just last night, I was wondering this, this very question. How many um, permits, I guess that's the right word, have been requested for how can I find out just for a particular area how many permits have been requested, say, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, last year? So on our website, we, and, and it's not separated out by um, neighborhood, right? But we could get you that information. Okay. So on our website, we show um, um, permit applications right. year over year. Right. So it goes back 10 years. Um, so, for instance, like last calendar year, we had 18,500 single-family permit applications. This year, we're, we're teetering around uh, 19,200, but we still have December to go. Uh, but, you know, but basically, if, you know, it's a, a chart that kind of goes down and it lets you know each year over year. 
but pretty much the gist of it is year over year we've increased in all land uses. Commercial, uh, residential, multifamily um, has also increased. So if you uh, give me your email address, yes, I can send it to you the parameters that I'm looking for and you can give me a general idea of what that looks like. Yeah. And let me say it for anybody who, who else would like to get this information. And also, forgive me for not introducing myself also when I started talking. My name is DJ Harrell, and I am the Director of Development Services for the City of Fort Worth. Um, you know, in, in development services, we're over zoning, we're over platting, uh, building permits, uh, and, uh, you know, preservation. So my email address is d, as in duck, dot j, as in joseph, dot Harrell, H-A-R-R-E-L-L, -L, at fortworthtexas.gov. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Okay, front row. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, acknowledging. I had a question for uh, DJ. DJ, and that was about, he said that primarily that the reason that there are so many apartment applications for this area is because of accessibility. Uh, and what I'm really asking, could we not think about trying to build more affordable housing where homeowners could purchase homes in on the east side rather than renters because we all we know that that really is the gateway to homelessness because if people can't afford rent they're going to end up on the street so have we not considered trying to provide more housing as opposed to apartments and so when you stated the stats we don't make it, and what housing is possible. Can we not try to address that issue? Absolutely. I, well, I also think it's a balance, right? Um, you know, like Amy uh, rightfully said, there is a need for apartment uses, but I do understand your 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 question and the thought behind it, right? Uh, should there be other land uses between high density multifamily and single family residences? So one of the things that we're looking at in the city, um, we we just uh, you know thank you David and and thank you all that you know uh, voted on the budget, but we just um, got approved to hire a consultant to look at this exact thing. Um, for you know w one thing that we're looking at is those uses between multifamily and single family. So some of your duplexes, some of your triplexes, your quads, you know we call that the missing middle housing. And so um, th this missing middle is unique in that it also provides a buffer between like the 5,000 square foot, you know, A5 residential to the, co the higher density, uh, dense commercial land uses. So if you just imagine a, a, a scale where there's A5 residential and then maybe there's duplex, maybe there's triplex, maybe there's quad, and then maybe there's higher density uh, multifamily uses. And so the goal is to make sure that all these uses contextually work together, you know, to, you know, to form our, com our community. Um, so we are looking at that exact thing. Uh, we've, uh, we're, we're getting ready to go out for an RFP to hire a consultant to help guide us through that. And at that time also, I'll say there'll be stakeholder engagement meetings like this so that we get feedback from the communities in which we serve. Is there ever a point where we just kind of go, it's too congested, it's just too much, we, you know, all our green space is gone enough, you know, and we just go, okay, we're topped out on people like apartments or whatever, otherwise we're going to have to expand the roads and make a big mess. Well, was that me? I'm sorry, guys. Well, I'm the permit guy. I get. I know I'm going to get the most questions. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I think, I don't think there's a, there's, there's an exact point that's been identified for that, but I do think that we also try to balance those open space and, and other uses in transportation and you know stormwater and drainage and water and sewer infrastructure. We try to address that as we go forward with these development types. For example, we've got an open space uh, acquisition program in the city where we try to you know, you know, focus on areas that we'd like to preserve for our city for open space. We also have parkland dedication policies. So 
you know, when a developer comes and wants to develop an entire neighborhood, we make sure that we get some clawbacks in order to ensure that we have adequate parks and recreation for the neighborhood that it's going to be, you know, going into. And so, so it's not necessarily a cap, but it's also trying to strike that balance. If and I, that would just, I would just add, there's something that I think we want to be very watchful for that we do at Zoning Commission is we have, you know, we don't want to give away what commercial space that we have already on the books. Uh, we had a case uh, mentioned about uh, John T. White earlier. It was a case, if you're familiar with the area, kind of over East Chase, John T. White over behind the, the Lowe's, uh, kind of catty corner there from the, the Walmart. A developer wanted to come in and put in uh, some uh, apartments, townhomes over there between uh, John T. White and Bentley Village. Uh, that's not what that area is zoned for. He bought the land. He had the temerity, and that's the kind word I'd use, to go ahead and tell a newspaper that this is what was going to go there and this is what was best for the neighborhood. Well, no, it wasn't. That's why I got voted down. That's why you stuck with the property. Great. We definitely, we, we just have to wrap this topic up. And I just want to ask maybe if our panelists can just do a, a, a really quick round robin, 30 seconds or less, what you'd like to leave um, our community members with, uh, with regard to this subject. I'll start with you, DJ. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, the only thing that I'll add, I, I know I've kind of monopolized this thing, but uh, I'll add is, in the city of Fort Worth, we do want to hear from you guys. We're not these city planners of the 80s that just sit down in the basement and make plans, right, that affect you guys on a daily basis. What we'd like to do is, you know, and we're trying to do a better job of stakeholder engagement to get feedback from the community on the decisions that we make. And, and just like we talked a lot about, you know, the zoning commission and the council hearings are um, areas for participation, but we're open every day. Right, and if you have a question, a concern, or if you'd like to participate in our comprehensive planning meetings, you know we welcome that type of participation from our uh, citizenry. Wonderful, Amy, briefly. Sure, I, I just want to let everybody know that affordability is going to continue to be uh, a hot issue. Um, in 2021, the Pew Charitable Trust did a survey across America, and they found that um, more than half of Americans think that housing affordability is going to be the top issue um, for the United States. It, it, it ranked above COVID, healthcare, crime, and jobs in terms of um, concerns for Americans. So as we think about zoning policy and we think about um, you know, where we're locating jobs and where we're, we're locating uh, transportation and transit networks, we really have to think through um, where we're locating housing and how affordable it is and making sure we're, we're covering that for the residents of our city and future residents too. Very very important. Um, get involved. I think that's a simple thing. Get involved. If you're a part of a homeowners association, you will find out about a proposed development coming to your part of town weeks before it hits the agenda. We find out at the same time that the HOA members find out, and usually it's at that point that I'm, you know, checking with the HOAs, or I'm checking in with Sandy and Gina going, hey, this this seems okay, or no, there's this isn't quite what I think we need to be doing, and we talk back and forth about that. So you have that in terms of involvement. If there is something that you suddenly find on an agenda on a Friday, they're published the Friday before our Wednesday meeting, usually late in the afternoon, send a letter. Like I said, I read every letter. I'm up until one in the morning reading letters. I should be going to sleep, but here I am reading letters because I want to hear from folks, and I'm very interested in their feedback. Take that time. You know, we talk about the importance of voting. Take the time to, you know, speak out to those of us who um, are volunteering our time to serve on these boards and commissions. Uh, we need to hear from you. We can't make our decisions in a vacuum. And attend community events like this one. So much um, appreciated. Raphael McDonald, Amy Connolly, DJ Harrell, we thank you for your insight. Let's give them a round of applause. And so what does it take to have a high-performing neighborhood association and how to energize members is what they're going to talk about. David, even though we have that case the other day, you can talk about banning signs until they tell us not to. Because so, I know what y'all do when you have these, these competitions. So, well, thank them for being here. Well, we are going to jump right in with our questions, and the first one, I am not uh, directing it toward 
uh, anyone in particular, but whomever would like to take the opportunity to respond, just um, go right ahead and feel free. What are some of the projects that you all have led that brought more engagement from neighbors or members of the HOA? Well, I'm the preacher in the group, so I'll take the first stab at it. Uh, what we've been able to do, uh, I think the first event that we had was an Easter uh, celebration in Rosedale Plaza Park. And that event really galvanized the community. It brought the children out. It brought a lot of the people who once lived in the uh, Calvill uh, development. It brought them back to the community. And it was a very, we worked in correlation with the Fort Worth Eastside Police Department. Our neighborhood officer, Officer Darty, rallied all of the troops. They provided the food, housing, uh, sponsored some of the events that we had. So it was really a, a, a community uh, gathering that brought the community together. And so I think that speaks volumes to what Stop Six is doing compared to the reputation that it's had. Uh, it was high crime. People didn't want to come to the east side. And once they see the changes that are being made, then we're trying to promote people to choose the east side for a place to make uh, make make their homes. Very, so, very good points yeah. made. Um, go right ahead. One of the things that we've done, we wanted to make sure that when a person came into our neighborhood, they knew where they were. And how did we do it? We, we approached uh, Crepe Myrtles. We said, Crepe Myrtles is going to be the say-so for our neighborhood. And we started off with a concept. We raised about $1,500. Uh, we got trees from the city of Fort Worth. There was a, a private uh, company that wanted to put in trees. And many of them, the first phase was around, uh, was around the Martin Luther King Center. Uh, and we got, in fact, we, saw, we started the project, project and there was people saw what was going on and they wanted to become part of it. And so they donated trees to, to that. And we had enough money to put in about 30 crepe myrtle trees and that's by working with local uh, local uh, companies, stores, uh, where they came up and provided us an incredible price. And so we put out within about a two-year period about 70-plus crepe myrtles and regular trees. And I just saw on the I talked to Sandy and Ms. Councilwoman Bivens that uh, I see that the, uh, the plants that's going in the island down East Rosedale of Crepe Myrtles. So, so we, we've got a lot to go. But one of the real interesting things that happened is that there was other people that saw what was going on, and even though they didn't necessarily join the association, they're aware of it. And that's, that's, that's very important. Um, we, we also looked at working, uh, Jonathan Morrison was here, but there was a group of them that worked together on persons who had criminal records, but they were eligible to be cleared, but it cost so much for them to do it. And the, so that was a project that we looked at, we supported, uh, and we got a national award for it for, uh, from the neighborhood group. Uh, we we're, we're decided at this particular point, we have an entry rate uh, way into our neighborhood, and that's stall cut. And that's something that we're going to take on as a neighborhood association because this leads to some of the best schools. Uh, in fact, one of the, the better, better, best schools in the city of Fort Worth, and that's the Young Men's Leadership Academy, Dunbar High School, and uh, the middle, middle school. So that's one, one of the things that we're working with. And we're also working with, uh, through our police department, and other individuals, we have a real problem about a park that's located in our community that we want to make sure there's some adults or police out there doing lunchtime. And that's another project that we're taking on. And, and uh, 
was going to say it later in here, but we as a neighborhood association don't take on any project that we don't set down, review, set as a goal. And if we assign individuals, we hold them accountable for getting results from those, those uh, activities, either on a monthly basis uh, or uh, on, under an established period of time that they have to show that they're doing something and not just talking. Right, all so very important. We wanna just move along to our next um, question here. Go ahead and weigh in. I'd rather just weigh in on the why a neighborhood association. Well, and I think that's going to really, I think you'll okay. be perfect to do so in the next uh, question. Here's um, what I think you might uh, welcome answering. What's the value uh, for it, for anyone to be in or participate in an association? It will be, I'm Dave Folson, I'm a director of the John T. White Neighborhood Association, and the answer to that question, uh, well, you're going to get out of it exactly what you put into it as a community, and, and we're all stronger together than we are as individuals. Uh, John T. White, like most of the big neighborhood associations, it's a very diverse group of people, uh, and that covers race, that covers age, that covers gender, that covers political lines. You know, we've got a great group of people, and we all have differences. Some live in homes, some live in apartments, some are, you know, in R2 and townhomes. But the people that tend to join an association want to take ownership of their area and they want to take ownership of the issues that affect their area. And job one on that, if you decide to get together with your neighbors and, and, and make a neighborhood association, you've got to build coalitions. And that starts with city leadership. And, and you know, uh, my fight years ago, what got me involved was a gigantic townhome project that they were going to put in areas that were not uh, zoned for townhomes. And it started as kind of a one-man fight. John T. White had kind of went fallow over the years. We just didn't have, uh, we didn't have the onslaught that we have now of development coming into our area. And, and we became really frustrated with it. We kind of have a slogan over in our area, we're trying to change, but right now it's apt. You know, the John T. White Neighborhood Association, you know, where, uh, you know, no new services, just new apartments. And, and you know, we, we fight really hard for zoning. For us, it's our battle cry. Zoning is everything to us. We worked with Councilwoman Bivens, who I cannot imagine under 15 lifetimes we could ever be more fortunate than to have Gina representing us and Sandy Bro and Wanda Conlon and Raphael, you know, as zoning commissioners that are tuned in with our area. We are so grateful to their participation and more than anything, we're grateful for their ear. Because when you need guidance or you are trying to make your point and, and, uh, and that goes all the way up to the city. We, we have worked really, really hard as an association to have the ears of our city, to be respectful and to be respected in return. And I believe we share that, uh, you know, Mayor Parker and Mayor Price before her, uh, David Cook, you know, he hears from us, all of our zoning commissioners hear from us. The key is being active, it's being engaged, and it's combining your voices. And, you know, we, we're seen as fighters, and a lot of times I tell the, I tell the commissioners, both in zoning and, and when we get in front of council, you know, we don't want to always be the party of no. God's sake, come at us with some good ideas, and we will be champions of the answer yes. Unfortunately, you know, we right now are under a tsunami of development in our East Fort Worth because what we all have, they don't have in a lot of areas, we have land. Yeah. And we appreciate our land and we appreciate our trees. And, you know, uh, the days are over in John T. White of developers coming in and just saying, well, we're going to buy land. It's not zoned for our intended purposes, but we'll purchase it and we'll rubber stamp that and get it and then we'll go into our next project. Those days are over. We may not always win, but we will damn sure always fight and, and we do. And, and I, would, I would say that is the key. It, you don't have to have a thousand people to make a difference, but it's volunteering your time and effort. I mean, my wife says this is, she comes home to my night job, but 
but we're proud of the fact that, that we are making a difference. And I'm always, and we try to work really hard with the other sister neighborhood associations and homeowner associations when we can. Because we don't just look at it as John T. White. And I know Meadowbrook and Hanley, they don't look at it just as, you know, stop six. We're all part of a, a combined community. And, and, you know, so we reach out and support others uh, when they ask us to give our two cents. And we often ask for their for their support too. So uh, if you are in an area that has an HOA or has a neighborhood association, get involved. If you don't have one, create one. And I always tell people, uh, Gina knows how to get a hold of me. If you would like to create a neighborhood association, we're pretty good at it. And we're always happy to help others uh, develop theirs, you know, your websites and your Facebook. So we're always try to be a, a resource for somebody who's trying to do what we've done. Getting involved and working together, two key things. I want to do a, a, a really brief round robin. Before we take a few questions, uh, for the interest of time, I'd, I'd like for each of you to uh, briefly answer or, or um, uh, communicate for your particular neighborhood, and they are unique, what is the number one challenge that you face and you don't have to go in depth but if state and, and and explain briefly the challenge the number one challenge you face it may spark some questions from our folks and we'd like to get to the questions so let's start with you Michael okay um, first challenge is safety uh, one of the things that we've tried to promote throughout our uh, neighborhood association is safety because if the community is not safe then people don't want to live where they don't feel safe. And so I've been taking that message throughout the community, talking to some of the, the uh, people that are uh, regulars of the community. And I've convinced them that if they want to become prosperous, that we've got to create a safe community first. Infrastructure uh, is important because the east side cannot look different from the west side and I think for too long the money has been spent on the west side and the east side has been treated like a stepchild. Amen. Great perspective. Yeah. Okay. And so what the push is is to push the citizens to participate in neighborhood associations so that their voice can be heard. Individually your voice is not heard. It's only when you are speaking through the neighborhood association is your voice heard? And so I've been really trying to promote that because we need safety, we need infrastructure, we need sidewalks, we need green spaces, we need uh, the uh, Young Men's Leadership Academy is, is one great asset that we can build around, but we need more parks, we need more facilities for people to get out and to have a, a feel of being community. And so that's one of the things that I, I feel that we need to emphasize. Great perspective. Safety among your top challenges. Let's move right to you, Dave. Briefly, what is the, the number you one challenge? On I'm sorry. You left me out. No, we're going down the road. All right. We're going <laughs> <laughs> to. I, I, I will be happy to let him go first but if you like. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Yeah. But, but it, it, it's, it's up to you who goes first, but yes, I just want to hear from you um, briefly from each of you about the number one challenge. Beauty, beauty goes first. Oh, that's, you got that, you got that all tied up. Uh, I think one of the most important things that we have right now is not, well, it's a couple of things that I need to put on the table. Number one, all citizens in, in our neighborhood is uh, important, regardless to whether we agree or disagree, it shapes where are you going? Uh, keep uh, residents informed, and that's either through a newsletter, through a, a news re, uh, report, uh, through television, not television, but through whatever method that we can use. And we kind of come back and discovered it's too expensive to try to put out a monthly newsletter. That's roughly $750 or more that our volunteers was paying for. That, that's a little bit too, too much. Don't set your meetings, stick to that schedule. Don't change them unless there is an approval of our membership. We don't wanna be flipping all over 
we want to know if they want to go to our neighborhood meeting, you can come because it's going to always be at this time in this place. Uh, set, uh, so that's important. Uh, attending uh, the areas that we need to answer uh, at all of our meetings with input and reports of what happened, and that's crime and, and law enforcement, uh, code violation uh, and code enforcement, uh, streets, uh, water, and, and drainage. And we are a historic overlay district. And what we do is that we drive our neighborhood and we make sure if there's something going on that shouldn't be like fences or changes in properties, then we take advantage of that and set measurable goals and evaluate them on a monthly uh, with a report back to our, our members about, uh, about what we've done within one month period, within a year, and we require an annual report because we feel it's important that even though you're having a good time talking and enjoying yourself at our meeting, it doesn't say what we've done. But you had a good time talking. Great. Great. I, I, I love that information. Keeping, keeping everybody informed. Knowledge is power. I'm not going to disagree with that one. <laughs> uh, when you know more and you know better, the better the lives for your family members and those around you. Now, Dave, how about the number one challenge? Well, I agree with knowledge is power <laughs> and shining the light on something good or shining the light on something bad can even be more advantageous to us as neighborhoods. You know, uh, I come from a little bit of a media background and something that we've tried to do when we're fighting a developer, which is the main thing that we tend to fight in the John T. White area, uh, very quickly they find out we're not just a little bitty island because we've made it our business to be friendly with not only our city leadership and our city staff, but our city media. And, you know, area issues that we've had to deal with have been on Channel 11, Channel 8, Channel 4, Channel 5. Uh, we've even been mentioned in the Dallas Morning News, but we've certainly been mentioned a lot in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And we are very active you know, as a, an association trying to get our messages out there to as big an audience as we can. Of course, we have a, uh, a good website and we have a Facebook page that we stay up to date on. But keeping our fighters, and I call them our fighters because that's generally what we do, keeping our fighters armed with information and what's current and, and what we need to, uh, the threats that we're facing, uh, that is job one with us. So zoning right now. We are seeing a literal tsunami of out-of-town, out-of-state developers coming at us wanting to take trees and put four stories of apartments in areas that aren't zoned for them. Now, again, I understand our area is diverse, and District 5 and especially our area over here, we are already oversaturated. There is a need for apartments, just like there's a need for A43 you know, the larger uh, single-family rural residential properties. We've got a really good mix. We've got townhomes, but we want to keep a good mix. We just don't want to knuckle under uh, to, the, to the, the, the call we keep hearing. We've got to build more affordable housing. We've got a lot of areas that are zoned for that. If you want to do it in our area, buy areas that are zoned for your intended purposes All or be ready important. for a fight. Very, very important. We have time probably for two questions. So... Right there with your hand up in the back. Uh, I know all of y'all, except for Councilman Moss, um, Cindy Bowling Central. Have y'all been successful, found some successful way to get young people to join your association? Young, in my definition, is anyone under 48. <laughs> 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 or maybe 50. <laughs> How do you get them off the <laughs> room? We, we just try to stay, if we identify an a person that's interested or a uh, new email address or whatever we can get. We try to get into the in contact with that, but it's also a matter, and this has always been with me, picking up a telephone and calling that person. Uh, we have just had a young man that's, that's, uh, that's joined, he, who want, he's the vice president right now, and he wants to walk the neighborhoods. Active engagement. Any other questions? Okay. Have you consulted on the high-speed rail that's about to go through your property or your uh, 
land there in uh, Long I-30 project. Who's the question for? Well, it's, uh, well, all three of you, actually. I mean, we've got a high-speed rail that's uh, being studied, environmental impact study, that uh, is going to fly right over these neighborhoods. That, that's not so topic, but I'll put you in touch with somebody who can answer, and I'll talk to you as well. They're strictly focusing on association. Well, and I think that's where it begins. Well, I promise you we'll be involved in it when when that comes our way, uh, yeah, you'll, uh, yeah, you will. Uh, you may not have heard from us yet, but they will. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. How many of you, every holiday season, just really get antsy when you hear all the fireworks going on? Yes. <laughs> I actually turned on, I turned on my sprinkler system two days before because it's really disturbing for me. When you call 911, it's hard to get somebody to come. But I can tell you these two neighborhood presidents took it upon themselves to start these talks with police and fire. And I'm going to tell you how these ladies roll. Both of them have been involved in the law. Cindy Bowley, I think it was 20, was it 2015? As well, that's when we got our legislation passed. The law. Well, there was a tragic accident. An officer showed up at Cindy and Mark's home. Mark, raise your hand. And it was the wrong house for the officer to come. But they had this border collie, so very friendly, border collie, right up to the officer, frightened the officer, and the dog was shot dead. Oh. And I met Cindy when I got elected in 2013. And she had been working with Nicole Collier and uh, who else? Charlie Guerin. Yeah, you got to add it too. And yes, ma'am, and we also worked with John Whitmire. So we had the top representative and the top senator in the state that actually John Whitmire reached out to me and said, can we carry your bill? And I, you know, you, I don't know if y'all know who John Whitmire is. <laughs> and of course, Charlie Gannon, but our amazing Nicole Collier. And T.J. Patterson. Yes, so, T.J. Yeah, Patterson, absolutely. who's still with the city. Cindy was able to literally craft a law that requires training for police officers, not just in Fort Worth now, but how, how far is it? Across the state of Texas in our law, our, our bill has also influenced other states to pass similar bills, and the De Department of Justice has modeled it into their training recommendations. So that, that's what I call take charge. Now let me tell you about charging. And that, that name was, I, I, I don't know how your parents knew that that's what you were going to be. But they named her accurately and appropriately. And I know you see Michelle, your, your Carter Heights buddy. Back in the day, there were convenience stores who would sell cigarettes one by one. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, well not, not, not in that area. But let me tell you. When, when those types of sales were going on, folk were using those to do dope. And so the police knew that the historic Carver Heights Neighborhood Association was just put up with that. They had a lot of foot traffic, people coming into their neighborhood at this one store, this one store where you could buy a single. And so Tarchi, with the police, what, was it a lawsuit that you joined? The police got fed up with the uh, with traffic. Okay, the police um, became fed up with the foot traffic, the pro drugs and prostitution, and the code violations on the property, and what that property generated, and what it sent into the neighborhoods, because it sent into the neighborhoods people looking for drugs, looking for prostitution uh, at many drug houses. See, we, um, we grew up in historic Carver Heights and many of us moved away. And we were educated in other states and we, and we came back to historic Carver Heights. Um, and we found 
that many of our historic, our parents who actually were fathers of this, of this city, um, we, they moved back, we moved back, and we looked around and we saw that our parents had been disrespected. You know, what, what makes our community historic is the fact that black people came into this particular community, they bought a piece of property, and they built their homes from the ground up. We are not a result of white flight. And as Judge Davis always says, we were the first to sit on those toilet stools. Okay. <laughs> Carver, Carver, Carver Heights was the first residential development in Fort Worth built by and for black people who could not build anywhere else because of racism at the time. Uh, when I grew up, we called it Teacher Hill because all of your educators and doctors lived over there. But what Tarchi ended up doing, the lawsuit that they were complaining so on, put a stop to all that foolishness. When I tell you about these two ladies, their next target, they joined forces. And they decided enough is enough with all these fireworks, all this street racing, and lo and behold, the new East Side commander arrived just in time. <laughs> and for, for her, for her very first meeting, she ran into those crazy John T. White people. And they told her, well, you heard Dave. They told her that plus four. But street racing was, was really the issue. But what they didn't know is that further east, we had four to six hundred cars involved in street races. And so these ladies took on two topics. I'm going to leave it up to Dion and this team so that they can tell you what they did, how they got to where we are, and what changes have been put in place. And I may just have to water my lawn one night before. <laughs> <laughs> so please thank them for coming. And okay, great. With that, we'll just uh, jump right in. We'll begin um, with, I'll, I'll pretty much um, have you each uh, briefly introduce yourselves once again w before you answer a question and remember the people in the back if you could just keep your voices elevated so that everybody can hear you but you all tell me who's best uh, to address this and and take it and run are there citations actually being written when citizens complain about fireworks in the city limits hello I'm commander Martin and so I'll address that question um, Again, when I first came on, um, two things hit me hard. What are you going to do about fireworks? What are you going to do about the street racing? And this was probably like my second day, and I'm like, I, well, let me see what I can do. Um, I went out and personally worked Fourth of July all three days, and I got to see what our citizens deal with when Fourth of July comes around. And we're not talking about black cats being popped. We're talking about things called COVID killers, a massive bombs over Baghdad, so to speak. And they're beautiful artwork, right? But I can see how it was a nuisance to the community and to the, to the, to the neighbors that were experiencing that and how it was a public safety. Uh, so I went back to my office and I was like, you know, how can, how can we fix this problem with the barriers that we do face in law enforcement? And so I thought about forming a fireworks committee. Torchy and Cindy had, had been in my ear for quite some time about you know things going on in their neighborhood. So I called them to the table and I was like, hey, we need to get some stakeholders to be a part of the committee so we can fall in love with the problem and have viable solutions versus just officers coming to the table and trying to fix the problems that were unique to each community that we served. And so for several months now, we have been meeting once a month, uh, talking about fireworks and solutions. So to answer that question, I think the department stance in the past was that we were not gonna act, we were just gonna hold our ground and make sure that if there were fires that FD could get there. But I tell you this, I am not about inaction because inaction means that we accept the behavior that people are displaying, the illegal behavior that people are displaying. So we have come together 
and form viable solutions. So our first test is going to be uh, December 31st um, because we do know fireworks and gunfire happens on New Year's Eve, correct? So we're going to have a team of officers that will go out and strategically address fireworks being popped in neighborhoods, right? We're going to have an undercover car that will also let our officers know, hey, we have a house here at 69 Lincoln. Go here and address that problem. We're going to confiscate. We're going to do citations. And these are going to be our key performance measures to let us know what worked, what didn't work, so that way we can adapt accordingly for the grand stage of 4th of July. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think that segues into what I'd like to perhaps um, have you address next, Chief. Um, a lot of times it's about educating um, uh, people in the community about why this is so dangerous. We, we know that it's illegal to uh, set off fireworks within city limits, but uh, because of perhaps the lack of education about the dangers, um, you just have people say, I can get away with it. What would, how would you weigh in on that and what more needs to, to happen to dispel that? Well, first of all, thank you. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Thanks for the work that you're doing with the police. That's fantastic. Um, because <clears throat> it can only be done in collaboration. So my name is Jim Davis. I'm the fire chief. I've been here a little over four years, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have, have the opportunity to talk to you. From a, from a safety standpoint, fireworks in every community present three big challenges. First of all, the challenge of dry conditions and setting fires to people's homes, people's property. Like the council member said, you know, wetting her yard down and her roof down because she's concerned about that. Secondly, is the injury and the injuries that have, can occur. We, um, in my four years being here, we have had fatal incidents in which someone has been struck in the chest with a firework and it was uh, fatal to them. We've had multiple hand injuries where fireworks have gone off in people's hands. Um, we attempt to work with the media uh, during the lead up to the 4th of July to talk about safety precautions. But to the commander's point, it's hard to say to people, hey, if you're going to break the law, do it safely, right? So it's, it's really difficult to do that. Um, we, we work uh, with some of the trauma centers around the, the region who actually treat these folks and we try to get public messaging out about the safety risks associated with fireworks. One of the big challenges is that they're illegal in the city of Fort Worth, but they're legal throughout the county. So last year as an example, just to give you, just not making excuses, just giving you a little bit of background, the county permitted 105 fireworks stands just outside the city limits all around Tarrant County. So that really does create some of the challenges. And so that's the third, the third complexity to this, the fire, the safety risk from medical components, and then the public nuisance part where you've got so much fireworks and you've got people being put in a position where they can't even get out of their own homes to get to work, to get to the hospital, to do those type of things. And there's where some of the issues that we've come upon that we try to actually prioritize our response because we get so many concerns about fireworks over that weekend period that it becomes a, a real challenge. So we, what we try to do is prioritize them working with the police. So, thank you. Certainly. Um, that is so very important, the safety aspect of it, um, because there are lives that have been lost from this type of thing. I want to move now just to maybe focus a little bit on the issue of street racing. Um, I've done the stories on this. I just want to thank you, <laughs> Commander, for uh, engaging me when I needed an interview. She was right there to, to talk about the issue. And it goes back to, I think, more about awareness. So um, whichever or whomever uh, would like to, to take this on uh, regarding street racing. Recently, the city uh, moved to toughen or stiffen the penalties for those uh, caught engaging in uh, street racing. Is that making a difference? And where would you say things stand right now with trying to combat this problem? 
Right. Yeah, so the second hot topic for me was street racing, right? Um, my family at John T. White and my family over in Miller, more importantly, Miller Street, was chaotic. We had a small area at Miller and Hardeman where we maybe had about 800 to 1,000 people that were congregating there, doing donuts, racing up and down the street. I mean, it was a scary sight to see, and I, I shared this with the people at the fireworks committee so they could know that some what some of the barriers we face when we're trying to address fireworks, right? And so um, our sisters and brothers over in Dallas, um, they had been dealing with street racing for quite some time, but they had got it minimized to such a level that it wasn't even a concern for them anymore. So I allowed for one of my sergeants who is here, and I'll let him speak here shortly, Sergeant Walker, and for officers to go over there and learn how they were doing it without even having a pursuit policy. And so they went over there and got some, some key ideas and brought it back home. So I'm going to let Sergeant Walker kind of introduce that. You got it. How are you guys doing? My name is Sergeant Matt Walker. I, uh, I work for y'all. I'm a patrol sergeant here on East Side. I got sent to Dallas to have a task force that deals with street racing. Um, they're very successful, so much so that we started to see it grow more here because they were leaving there. Um, I've been working with the city. I've contacted the city attorney. We've talked about different ways that we could be better here in Fort Worth about dealing with it. Um, we're aware of it. I see it. It's going on on all sides of town also, but uh, uh, I, I understand what you are saying, and believe me, I've been working. You ask anybody in uniform in here or anybody in uniform in the city of Fort Worth, they'll tell you, you ask who the street racing guy is, they'll say, yeah, I'm, work I'm working on it, and I annoy the crap out of them by talking about it, so they know about it, all right? <laughs> tell them about some of the successes we've had thus far, just on East Division. So uh, my whole thing with this is, is these guys are driving a lot faster cars than we are. Chasing them is dangerous. It is, and uh, so we've started using different techniques in order to actually ar make arrests on these guys and without having to chase them, which is I think is key uh, because they have a tendency to always run. But um, there's been about 14 incidences where we've managed to make an arrest on some of these, uh, at least Nine guns were recovered in all of these, so these aren't like the safest things. Lots of drugs. I mean, I understand what's happening, and I know, has anybody in here been trapped in one of these before? Ever seen one of these? <laughs> what about a... I've been worldwide outside this building when I came to handle it. It's called mm -hmm. a takeover. Yes. Takeover, it, they take over an intersection and don't allow mm -hmm. any traffic, uh, other traffic to come through. It's two different, yeah, there's two different things I'm speaking of when I speak of street racing. I am talking about the takeovers where they take over an intersection, hundreds of people, uh, sometimes thousand plus, sometimes it's a parking lot. And then I'm also talking about the drag racing, which is scary, and I understand that, especially when you're driving home at night and somebody goes by you so fast you never heard them. And then you jump out of your seat and you almost wreck yourself, right? So I've, I've seen it and witnessed it myself. But we are having success with some of these strategies. We're working on them. We're working with the city to try and make this a citywide thing because this is not just an east side thing. It's heavy everywhere. And uh, I guess that's all I have for now. <laughs> Great. I would like to take a, a few questions and hopefully we can give uh, some of our uh, panelists who have, have yet to weigh in. You have a question. Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> Chief, you enlightened me to something I did not know. Over a hundred permits issued by Tarrant County for the sale of fireworks. How do we stop that? <laughs> BS. So I don't know that I have a good answer for you on how to stop that. I will tell you that working with the city and the city manager's office, city attorney's office, we have reached out to Tarrant County, to the, to the folks at, and, and we have attempted to have dialogue and conversation about that. Who in Tarrant County have you reached out to? Um, the, uh, Tarrant County has a fire marshal that, that oversees all the unincorporated areas of Tarrant County regarding yeah. the fire. So, um, you know, I, I, I can, I can reach back out and you and I can sit down and talk to I them. would like that very right. much. Torchy, I'm would happy you to too? Yes. Anybody um, else want to talk to the fire marshal about issuing these permits to burn down our homes and ca cause chaos in our si in our neighborhoods? I, yeah. see a, I see a hand up. I would. Oh, okay. 
I'd like to get in a few questions for our panelists, if we could, before we run out of time. Go right ahead, and you're in the standing in the red hat. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've got a couple of questions. I'm going to try to be brief so you can answer briefly and get to others. First of all, with regard to the firewoods, when I call, you tell me, what, you ask me what is the address. I don't know what the hell the address is. I'm in my bedroom trying to keep my head down. So I can't these no address. I can tell you that lying in my bed, it's southwest or southeast of me, or it sounds like it's coming from the northeast or whatever, about two blocks over from my address or whatever. Um, I did have a talk with one of my neighbors who told me that he is doing the fireworks. Because I said, it sounds as though it's coming in the alley between these two streets, da 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 da. So he admitted, yes, I am doing it. I told him he needs to quit because that ain't cool and it's against the law. Uh, and then add into the fireworks firearms. Okay, you can't just go that it's fireworks because it's firearms. Why are they out there just letting it off? That, and, and how do we address that? That's question number one out of so along with this detail that we're running, it will be a fireworks and gunshot detail. That's why we have the use undercover vehicle that will be there that will be searching for anyone out there shooting guns. That way he can, they, he'll know where to deploy our resources to and fireworks. Now to your other question about when you're calling into communications, just be as general as you can, as specific as you can about where you think it is coming from. And we can have officers dispatch in the area and they'll look and try to see if they can figure out where it's coming from. Tell you without a shadow of a doubt that that ain't happening because I'm I'm right here and I sneak a peek out the front door and they're right in the intersection at the this and this cross street. You talking about the person door. shooting firecrackers? Uh -huh. Okay. And I'm, I'm on and on and on and I tell them where they are. They never come yeah. and they're going uh, let out these fireworks until two three in the morning and it sounds like a. Uh, we're in uh, Afghanistan, Baghdad, uh, Ukraine, wherever. It sounds like a war. So, so, the overtime? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. right. So, Miss Reba, um, and, and everybody in here, we have to have realistic expectations about how our officers are responding. That's one of the reasons why I created a special detail for these officers that will not be answering just calls for service. They'll be targeting calls for fireworks and calls for gunshots. Uh, so, but as far as calls that come in for service to dispatch officers, we're always gonna protect life first, right? So if we have someone that is out there, a family violence situation, versus a fireworks call. We will dispatch to the family violence. The fireworks call, unfortunately, will you know, be dispatched at a later time, but we have to take priority over life. And I just want us to have realistic es expectations about what barriers police face when we go into these calls, when 4th of July happens, because calls go up, not just firework calls, all calls go up. So we have to take into consideration how stressful that is for dispatch to try to get these calls out, for, fi for officers to try to make it to these calls. So that's why it was so important to collaborate with the community, to educate the community on barriers. Street racing is one of the barriers that we face, and that takes a lot of resources when we get called to those type of situations. And so one of the things that we generated is targeted enforcement. And so we're gonna try this in East and see how it works. And remember in my speech, I said, we're gonna have key performance measures that'll let us know what worked, what didn't work, what we need to adapt to, what we need to keep, what we need to get rid of. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. We would like to get in some other questions. If, uh, uh, let's see a show of hands. Oh, okay. In the Santa hat. Okay. Well, that, that, this question is, is it goes right along with what you said about starting on the 31st. If they start this coming weekend, which is what they will do and go throughout. 
So no, no, she's she's fine. Um, so Miss Reba, we're doing something that we haven't done before, right? In okay. a long time. Remember, I said we have been the, the we have been inactive on it, right? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. We have been inactive on it. So the week before, we're gonna go out to communities. We created a flyer, and we're gonna re-educate the community because that's part of enforcement as well to let them know that hey, this is illegal. There are penalties when you are out here doing things that are illegal. So uh, three days before, we're going to go out, do, do our community walks to re-educate the community. And then on the 31st of December, we'll be out there. And this is just a start to something that we haven't been doing in a long time. Chief, did you want to weigh in briefly on it? You know, I just would like to add to, to everything that was said that the 911 system that you spoke of, there's a published fireworks hotline number. And I, and I, I want to I explain to you the purpose of it, though, because I think this is important. And that is the primary purpose of that number is to keep those calls off of the 911 system. What we found was that everybody, everything else is busy as well, right? And so those calls going through the 911 system actually causes disruption to the phone system and, and actually creates a lot of problems. So the purpose of the firework hotline number is to take the calls off of the 911 system and also as far as the addressing that you're you're commenting about the goal of that is to create heat maps of areas of increased call volume from fireworks to send a targeted um, group out to drive through the neighborhood see if they can actually put eyes on people that are doing it does someone answer that line Yes, yes. I, 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 and, and I know that, and I asked that question to say to you, respectfully to all of you, and to the people who are going to that it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work. Well, I'm going to help by doing my part, because as a journalist, I'll probably be giving you a call next week, Chief, to um, uh, for an interview, and so that we can get uh, as much information included within our newscast and share it with all of our viewers. Let's take the next question. I promised her in the, in the Santa hat. Let's, let's do that and then I'll get to you. My question is a stepchild to street racing. How do we appropriately respond to the donuts and the circles at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning? What's our best response? <laughs> Are you speaking about large groups or like one or two vehicles? One offs. Well, I won't lie to you though. The one offs are pretty hard because some 16 year old performing in front of his girlfriend is pretty difficult sometimes. And sometimes it is related to the overall large groups that are breaking up and just not going home yet. But what I would ask you to do though is please dial 911, describe the vehicle and where it is. That'll help me out tremendously. Now, just because an officer shows up and doesn't make a report. I read the 911 phone calls every Tuesday when I come in on my Monday just to see how many and where they are. Because I oftentimes like to report all the way up. Again, I, I annoy people about this stuff higher than me sometimes, but, and, and let them know where it's going on. So if you see that, please make a 911 phone call. If you have a description, please give a description. If you have a plate, fantastic. And all of those things also go into a stats also, like he was talking about a heat map. Those things show what's going on in the city. That also gets a reaction from higher up as far as resources. And as you all know, resources dictate tactics. So <laughs> I'm, I, I'm going to take you. a question that was uh, over here, and then I'm going to move to the gold jacket on the end of the front. So state yours, sir. Yes. What about noise pollution? Would that also be <coughs> I mean, if it's at night, then definitely call 911 so they can get that call dispatched to our officers. If it's something during the daytime and you have your MPO's number, definitely give them a call. Even, even if you call 911 at night, the very next day, follow up and let your MPO know as well. We, we have to prevent information distortion, right? So we have to, when we see something, say something, that's been the theme, right? And like, like we have said, we look at that data. 
And that is how we are deploying our resources based off that data. I've had several people tell me that, hey, we're, we've been calling about street racing, and then I go and pull the call, and I've had two calls. Well, what that shows is that it's not a big concern because it's nothing but two calls going there. So maybe it's something that isn't happening on a constant measure. So if you guys are seeing something, please call in and let us know. We look at that data. That's how we deploy our resources. That's how we become strategic and how we find solutions for it. Thank you, Commander. You in the gold jacket. I want to share with y'all where I call them the These are carpets. These are carpets. Okay. I'll have to look into that. Are you calling it in when you when you see it? Yeah, we call our MPO area for Okay. Okay. Tell your MPO, but call it in, please. Please call it in. I, I can't express that enough. When you see it, call it in. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that John T. White has um, some input here because John T. White actually their information is what came to us. <clears throat> and made us aware of the street racing. So I want to make sure that Dave Fulton has some input in because he does have input into our fireworks situation. Well, unfortunately, we have a lot of input because they, they use us as, uh, uh, the, they call it the stunting. It's not the drag racing as much as it is the circles and shutting it down. They're very organized events, as the officers know. And we've kind of been filtering it. But we had a uh, one of our president of our association lives on the corner of John T. White and Cooks, and he got out there on one of the worst nights and had his camera. And it, we had it on eleven, four, five, eight, and I mean that thing made the rounds. It was all over our website. We shared it with you know our sister neighborhood association. And I, I want to say this: the Fort Worth Police Department's response to it was so immediate and so effective. <coughs> Commander was out there, you were interviewed by the right on the corner, got to see it firsthand, and Regina's office was involved in it. The police response was, was wonderful. And not only just to come out there, you know, they did something about it, we now have a camera up there. And with the light that we were able to shine on it, you know, we sent them scurrying somewhere else because you know, the commander said, well, the next time they come, the eye in the sky will be here and we will be making a, an impact. We will we will bring some financial pain. We will impound some cars. And we are very grateful. But, you know, that little camera that you carry everywhere, uh, you know, don't put yourself in danger. But if it's happening in your area and you can get it, let, let me tell you, it's, it's very helpful. And, and the police are trying so hard to work with us and if we can work with them to help us, hey, it, uh, John D. White has proved that work that work and we're very and also, I want to add some. I want to add some input to this yeah. real quick. That um, Cindy and I did go down to the city council, and we did ask for additional funding if we need more funding to put a cap on fireworks and street racing. We went and we asked for that CCPD money because that is what it is for. Yeah. So if yeah. we need some money, that's where we're going to go and ask. We for have it a hand again. in the back. I'd like to get to. Enforcement regarding the fines uh, after citations are issued. Who can so, take that on? So that's going to be a court-related question, and unfortunately we don't have a representative here. Now, I will tell you this. I worked in the courts for six years um, as a, a, a court liaison. When we get the tickets, we push the tickets to, to the uh, pros uh, prosecutors, to the courts for them to put it in. So I can't see if our officers are out there writing a citation that they just dismiss that citation. Okay. I think we're going to take, like, two Can more questions. Can, Can you I go ahead? So I, I will tell you that... Uh, Fourth of July holiday, we did do a trial program using the camera system with fireworks. Mm -hmm. We did write uh, more tickets than we had written collectively in the previous couple of years. Uh, citations were issued, um, and the, we did work with uh, our, our, our colleagues in the court system to make sure that that was uh, done correctly, 
that that was defendable and that um, we had worked with the city attorney's office on that as well. So, so what was their feedback? Well, I, I, I think that that remained coming into the upcoming events, we, we need to relook at that. There were questions that were asked, um, but overall, it worked. So the questions that need to be need to be finalized about whether or not we're going to continue that. Okay, we're going to wrap with the hand in the back has been up so patiently. Um, can you stand and, and state your question, and then we're going to wrap up. I had a question with gunfire. I was caught from gunfire shot two days ago. Officer came out real fast, 15 minutes, drove right by. And they pulled in the parking lot, they even, even slow down, really, and clear out the car. Because I called back 911 and asked if the, uh, the uh, car still active. Because now it was clear. I left it like that because it's not the first time they did it. I don't know why they don't want to pull it in the parking lot. Too scared? Go find another job. You know, because this is, that's not the first time. And I want to know what's, what's the process of if I give you an address, should you pull into that location? Take a look at what's going on. Somebody could die laying on the floor, but nobody's, it just kind of drove by there. So when you called it in, what details did you provide? I told them the address where, uh -huh. I, where I heard it And I'm from. sorry, sir, I can barely hear you. I, I told them the address where I heard it from. I stayed right across the street. I heard it from there, so I gave them the address. Then I told him it was too good fire. It went right after it went right after each other. I told him before that, 30 minutes ago, it was a crowd of people hanging out over there. And right now, I don't see a couple people hanging out over there. Saw the officer came through there, drove right by it. Then pulled in the parking lot. Then, you know, I would think they pulled in the parking lot to kind of that's the kind of look. See, do we see anything? Where, where, where was it? I didn't know. The, uh, wow. it was a car wash. It was a car wash on Lancaster. Oh. And can you hang around and talk to the commander afterwards? I can. Okay. We are right. over time. I always having such a good time. I lost track. Certainly, certainly. We're going to uh, close with uh, some remarks by the Mayor Pro Tem Bivens. But first, just a round of applause for our panelists and their insight on all this topic. I'm not going to keep you any longer. I just want to thank you for your time, for your support. Don't whisper, you know I can't see, I came here. Would you, would you? Huh? Oh, Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Huh? Can we, can we work this lady in the red back here? Just one Come on down so we can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> My name is Kafka Edney. I live on the east side. Commander Martin is my daughter. Oh, wow. 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 I would like no, to thank her no. and her team. All the police Fort Worth uh, police officers on the east side that have really wow. had her back. Mm -hmm. This young lady I'm so proud of. I live on the east side of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And she know a lot of things that we have been through. My husband retired from the Fort Worth Police Department, Lieutenant Edney. Okay, no way. <laughs> <laughs> but he used to also be assigned to the east side. Stand behind us like that, Oh, okay. <laughs> and I also have my other daughter, Ashley. Ashley, Edney, come down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she really has a passion. For her job mm -hmm. at the east side of Fort Worth because she finished from the east side of Fort Worth. So she really had a passion for it. And I watch her every day trying to figure out how can she make the east side better. So she's not fake at all. And I'm not saying that that's because she's my daughter. She really do care about the east side of Fort Worth. And it's a hard job because we know we are short of officers. We and love her.